So anyway, Bob has his channel and he has Soco Films. Uh, I've got the Soco Films link below. Um, Bob, tell us about you first. Tell us what your the context of our chat today, your background, wh what you're comfortable talking about, and how you got into Speakers Corners debates and anything else you want to tell us about you. Okay, um, I I I became a Christian uh, because of a Muslim uh, who. Uh, he tried to convert me to Islam when I was at school. Uh, he was a big fan of Ahmadidat, and he just assumed that everyone who was uh, white and English was a Christian. And so he 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 tried to you know use all of these kinds of arguments on me. And I came from a working class background, and um, my family, much like lots of English working class, had this kind of notion that they were. Church of England, you know, they were they were Christian because at baptisms they would baptize their children, at weddings they would go to church, and at funerals they would get a priest to come and say some nice words before sticking people in the ground. Without any real faith or without re any real understanding of what it means to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so when uh, my Muslim friend uh, tried to attack the Christian faith, I thought he was attacking something English. Um, so I, I leapt to its defense in ignorance. Uh, just to give you a level of my starting point uh, in one of these discussions that I remember because of how embarrassing it was, um, he said, he said, let's test how much you know. And he asked me, you know, what's the first book of the Bible? I didn't know. And someone said Genesis. And then he said, well, what's the second book of the Bible? I didn't know. And someone said Genesis 2. And I just said, yes, Genesis 2. So that just tells you how little I actually knew. Is that not, cor is that reading... not correct? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. So I, I, I started looking into it. I, I, I started learning about all of these apologetics and polemics. And then I remember um, through a, a Christian church, a summer mission that I did in London, I, I came into contact with a guy called Jay Smith who is a wonderful uh, polemicist and apologist from America. Um, and he, he really inspired me. He was the first time that I'd met someone who was, who was doing evangelism to Muslims in the same way that I was. So I went to Speaker's Corner a couple of times. And then when I lived in London um, years and years ago, I used to irregularly visit Speaker's Corner. Um, and then... You know, life took me on a certain course, which led me back to the question of considering my vocation um, and, and, and how to do that. And that led me to London. And I wanted to get involved in supporting Jay Smith at Speaker's Corner. And the, the week that I went to find him, because I knew where he, uh, he, hung, he, he hanged out uh, before he went to Speaker's Corner, um, he told me he was leaving. So he was leaving and going back to America. And he'd done Speaker's Corner for decades um, and been one of the sole voices making a commendable defense of the faith down there. And um, uh, he was leaving, and his first week that he wasn't at the corner, that you could tell the Dawa team was in glee at the thought of not having Jay there and his booming voice. Um, it was my first week there, and I'd been going solidly to Speaker's Corner for about two years it is a, a strategical platform that's of great importance to the church because it's broadcast across the entire world. Some of the Muslim speakers have followers that go, that go into the millions. You're never going to have an opportunity to evangelize uh, that many Muslims in one go um, or that many people in one go. It's a fantastic opportunity. It does speak to a certain kind of person, the person who weighs truth by which argue, which person seems to win the argument, which is not necessarily the best way of weighing what is true, um, but it does speak to that kind of person. Um, and it's a platform I recognize the strategic importance of, um, and, you know, it, it's one that, that the church needs to. So that's why I go there. And, um, you know, I go there to, to basically uh, to evangelize the Christian faith and to stand against those that are opponents to the Christian faith. And it just so happens because of the demographics of Speaker's Corner and the demographics around Speaker's Corner, that that tends to be Muslims, um, who I have a love and a passion for anyway, because I became a Christian because of a Muslim, and I have done lots of evangelism amongst Muslims my whole life. Um, and it's something that I, I care very greatly for them as a people. 
I, I want them to, to, to know the truth of our Lord, to, to be his disciples like I want everyone else to be. And I feel that God has placed that, that, that calling and that desire on my heart. I hope that, yeah, as a basic intro. That's interesting. Um, just two questions before uh, on that before we get into the other stuff. Um, just out of curiosity, did, did you have any training in philosophy or is your training mainly under Jay Smith as an apologist? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just curious if you no, no, not did at you all. study rhetoric I, I, and I, did you study rhetoric and debate or did you just focus on apologetics? I I think everything that I everything that I do in terms of debate is something that I, I I've just done through experience. Like I I. The, uh, you'll often hear me talk about the, the Dawah team using a script. And the reason why I describe it as a script is because invariably Muslims say the same arguments the same way over and over and over and over and over and over again. And when you've been around that, that circuit a number of times, you kind of know what's going to be said before it's said. And, and you develop responses to that. Um, and you also pick up like, you know, little tactics of rhetoric and, and, and stuff like that. But no, I've not had any formal training. I did uh, study in my first year at university philosophy, um, but I went on to specialize in um, religious studies as I felt that was more important. Um, I also studied physics in my first year as well. Um, and philosophy, obviously, the study of philosophy obviously introduces you to argumentation and, and the, the idea of constructing an argument, but I've not had particularly formal training now. Yeah, well, actually, uh, just being in the, the sphere of debating and doing that a lot is really how you get good at debating. I mean, that's that's the way. Yeah. I mean, we started when I was in um, college, we would go out on campus and we would debate the atheists, we would debate the Buddhists, we would debate uh, all the different groups that we found on campus that were willing to do debates. And so just doing that constantly, going to coffee shops, going to uh, atheist events yeah. and, and having the debates is really the best way to, to to learn to debate and to get good at it. Because like you said, it's kind of the same with atheism. You'll notice that you hear the same kind of rehash things over and over and over. So yeah. a lot of times people ask me, do you get nervous before you debate an atheist? No. And it's not because of, oh, I've got such a high IQ. And it's not anything like that. The reason I'm not nervous about it is because I already know all of the limited number of iterations of the atheist argument that I'm going to hear. And by the way, um, it's funny you said that about a, an Islamic apologist or, or guy getting you into Christianity. There was a um, Jehovah's Witness girl that I knew when I was uh, about 18 and I was new to Christianity. I was new to reading the Bible. I just read uh, the Beatitudes at the time and I met this Jehovah's Witness girl and I think she was really intent on bringing me into the Jehovah's Witnesses and so she yeah. sent, she sent me all these texts. She's like, "How do you respond to this verse that shows that Jesus is a creature?" And so that mm. actually kicked me off into apologetics. Was another you know sort of anti trinitarian group. So um, that's that's a, a encountering um, challenges are actually good ways to you know iron absolutely sharpens iron absolutely. And I think I think I think Christians you know if there's any Christian out there who's thinking about you know, how do I get good at this? The answer is start doing it, you know, and, and but, but have the humility to learn from your mistakes and, and to to learn. Like I'll, I'll often sit there and I'll listen to presentations by others and noting down good arguments as I hear them and, and imagining how I might then use them in argument myself. Um, in what circumstance might I use a particular line of argument, you know, and it's just a case of study, practice, failure, study, practice, success, study, practice, failure, study, practice, success. And this process refines you in, in, in terms of your ability to do it. But evangelism is, 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 a, is one of the callings of our Lord. And, and it's something that we have to do, um, you know, and there are different styles of evangelism. Me and you go for the more direct academic debate, confrontational style of evangelism. Um, it won't speak to everybody, but it, but it speaks to some. Um, but it is, but most importantly, the kind of style of debate that you and I do is the kind of thing that influences cultures. It's the kind of inf the, the kind of debate that can influence decision makers, the kind of debate that can influence people in authority. It might not win over masses of people, maybe apart from some people who are rigorous and, and intellectual and, and follow the evidence where it leads. Um, but it can influence people and it can influence cultures. So it's really important that the church is present in the intellectual debate and not absconding from it for the sake of doing more socially based evangelism, you know?
Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, all the church fathers, all the great apologists who really hammered out the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, in the early centuries, they were apologists. They were doing apologetics against various groups that already, you know, in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries were denying Christology, denying the Trinity, denying the full deity of Christ, denying the deity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, St. Basil yeah. comes to mind as somebody who's who's very important in that role. But yeah, I mean, if we're not doing apologetics, then we're not doing what we're actually called to do, because that's part of evangelism. You're absolutely right. And as Paul says, all things to all men. So we want to speak to the academic. We want to speak to the average Joe. We want to speak to everybody as best we can. Yeah. And, God, and God gifts us all with different gifts to be able to do that. So um, do you want to move on now to the topics of yeah. like your experiences of what are some of, I know that Lewis sent me, for example, about 15. Um, I've encountered some of yeah. these, but you have had way more experience debating people in the realm of Islam. And I've only had a limited experience with this. I've had one debate with Paul and then I've had four or five debates with uh, people in my discord who uh, had various mm -hmm. views on Islam. I, I never could get the exact view of Islam. So my first question to you before we launch into those texts is that, so in my limited experience of debating uh, Muslims, uh, when I bring up the topic of the Trinity or divine simplicity, I actually have gotten five different views just from ran five different random Islamic debaters. Is that the norm with you? Do you find that they, they when you get to a really, I know you talk about them sort of running on a script, but when you get really precise on certain things, I've not been able to nail down exactly what the Islamic view of divine simplicity is or this uh, uh, doctrine is, it's, it seems to sort of morph and, and transform based on who you're talking to. Um, well, my, yeah, I mean, my experience of, of debating with Muslims at the corner is that depending on who they're talking to, the same person um, will, will, will wax on what they understand about the Trinity. And, and a perfect example of that would be Hashim. Who knows very? Who actually is quite erudite and educated about what Christian doctrine is, but sometimes he will he will feign a level of ignorance that he doesn't actually have about the Trinity, um, because it, it will help him to make a point. So you'll often hear Muslims, the same Muslims, um, say to a Christian like myself um, when they're you know surrounded by a more uh, erudite audience that they know that Christians believe in one God but then say that there are issues with that concept of their belief in one God but if they're speaking to someone who's a bit more of a pushover and a bit more ignorant and they can feel that they'll 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 just say well you Christians believe in three gods and it's kind of like depending on who they're talking to they actually change what they say in terms of their critique and and I've seen that very clearly with people like Shamsi and Hashim and and others, there's no consistency in their intellectual critique of the Christian faith. You know, they'll they'll on the one hand, they'll say that Christians believe in three gods. But then on the next hand, depending on who they're talking to, they'll say, we know that you Christians believe in one God. So it's kind of like they can't seem to to make their mind at what we believe. And I think the reason for that um, is because the Quran, they, they're trying to hold to the fact that you've got a modern education where information is readily available, so anyone can learn that Christians believe in one God. But then you've got what the Quran says, which is in total error, where it says that Christians believe in three gods. And they're trying to balance these two uh, forces together for political gain, as it were, within the, the, the argument. What about when you're, when you're getting them to be precise about their doctrines, though? Because that's kind of the approach of... of Apologetics that I often do is critiquing not just the arguments that is that, that are being presented, but the actual worldview of the other of the person. Have you found them to lay out a consistent doctrine, for example, of this, the unity and simplicity of God? Because I've again I've heard multiple different doctrines of the of, of what God's unity and simplicity actually is, and and the reason I bring it up is that that's ironic because when they're refuting our our or attempting to refute the doctrine of the Trinity, that it's polytheism and all this. When I turn the argument around and, and get them to try to explain to me how they conceive of unity and multiplicity in relationship to God, I don't actually hear a coherent uh, response. I hear five, ten different doctrines of what God's unity and simplicity is amongst Islam. And I'm just wondering if your experience is that they, they, do they actually present a consistent um, Islamic theology? I, I don't hear that in their system. Yeah, and I think I think that, that that's fair. Um, but you've got to understand, Jay. There's very few people that would tentatively and try to engage with Christian, uh, sorry, with Muslims on their own theology. 
you know, we we Christians, particularly in the West, are at a disadvantage in the sense that Islam is relatively new to our shores. And so engaging with it intellectually is something that we're not particularly coherent with or, 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 or yeah, well versed in, you know. Yeah. We, 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 we are in a position to do that with Jehovah's Witnesses or with Mormons, or but not so much with Islam, partly because all their texts are primarily in Arabic or foreign languages that we can't read. Uh, and so it's only as these, these texts are starting to be translated that we're able to start wrestling with their vision of God. Um, and the inconsistencies are now becoming more and more apparent. And, and the perfectly most obvious one, which we'll definitely come into shortly, is this idea that God can't enter into his creation. You know, Muslims have been having a field day challenging Christians about how can the infinite become finite and how can the all-powerful become limited and, and, and become God. But yet, you, when and, and, as, and then they present to the ignorant this idea that their God doesn't enter into his creation. But yet, when you read Islamic texts, it's so clearly apparent that Allah enters into creation. Um, and so all of their arguments against our incarnational beliefs collapse when they when when you start pinning them down. But I think also within Islamic circles themselves, uh, Islam doesn't have the same emphasis on theology as the church does. We Christians define our identity by our doctrine, whereas Islam is very much more focused on the idea of obedience to laws and the obedience of five pillars. So it's much more about praxis than it is about theology. And that means that, you know, Muslims don't engage with that kind of discussion deeply. But I think the, 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 the kind of debates that we need to be having are, are pressing in on their theology, are pressing in on their doctrines. Yeah. Because actually it's, it's loaded with inconsistencies given the rhetoric that they use against the Christian faith. Let's get to some of those inconsistencies before. Let's start with some of their uh, polemical critiques of us and their arguments, and then we'll move to some of those key inconsistencies that you are familiar with and that you've encountered. So I like that main point, though, because uh, uh, God entering into time and space and that being a problem in their theology, um, that's kind of where many of the debates in my discord with Muslims led to, because we, when we come to the issue of how does the Quran <laughs> actually convey truths about God within time and space, that's kind of really where, yep. uh, the, the rubber hits the road for difficulty yeah, for them. Exactly. But they've not, they've not thought through, yeah. they've not thought through the implications of, of what the Quran actually says, vice versa. That. That's a good point. Okay. So, um, let's see, what are, let's see, one of the first things that you usually hear is. Something like, well, if Jesus is God, then he died and God can't die. So Christianity is a false religion. <laughs> is this one of the most common that you hear? I mean, I've heard it. Not, I don't even do many of these debates with, it, with Muslims. I've heard it like five times already. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a common argument that's used and, and, and it's based upon, you've got, to, you've got to understand that all of their arguments, all the arguments that are used by Muslims are aimed at the idea of proving that Christ was not God. That is the, 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 the driving point behind virtually all of these kinds of arguments. Um, so, so they're denying the incarnation. So fundamentally, it's because they, they are not engaging with the idea of the incarnation that this, this kind of argument um, is being made. And they are unwilling to engage with that. So, for example, and, and I want this not to be sort of me doing a, a, a seminar, but, but to us to have a, a discussion, because I know that you have a lot of very uh, interesting uh, philosophical angles that you can bring to these kind of conversations. Um, so I want this to be a bit of a ping pong, really, to, to look at how, you know, silly some of these arguments are. Um, and thus, while you're talking, it allows me to find uh, some of the passages that I'm I'm looking for. Okay, well, yeah, I would say um, my response to this would be uh, this is a misunderstanding of what our doctrine of Christ is. So we, we believe that Christ possesses two natures. So he's always possessed that divine nature from all eternity because he's a divine person or divine hypostasis. So these kind of confusing terms that we use are there for a reason. Uh, so terms like hypostasis, terms, terms like usia or nature uh, in the Greek and the new, that are actually used in the New Testament, um, they for us are the models of how we understand these doctrines. So Christ, when he became incarnate, he was the second person of the Godhead from all eternity with a fully divine nature. 
And when he assumed human nature, he never destroyed or lost his divinity. He didn't destroy or lose the full humanity. He possesses both of those natures in perfect union. And they're not destroyed. Mm. They're not, they're not uh, absolved. They're not melded. They're always in union and yet always still retaining, as we say, their created natural properties. And so when we speak of the death of Christ, there's a, uh, one of our great theologians, St. John Damascus, has a great section in Book 3, The Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, where he talks about the death of Christ re- per- pertaining to his human nature. So Christ absolutely Amen. did undergo death in his humanity. And so his body was, uh, his soul was severed from his body in that death, but his divine nature remains and always remained impassable. And that means unchangeable, unalterable. So the divinity underwent no, uh, change. Um, God can himself cannot change. He cannot be altered. He can't be destroyed. He can't die. But so when you see in the church fathers or in, even in scripture at times, there's, there's phraseology that we use that's called appropriation. Um, one of our other great theologians, St. Cyril of Alexandria, uh, called this the communication of properties. And what this means is that it, anything that's true of one of Christ's natures, such as eating, drinking, um, dying, that's true of his humanity, um, can also be spoken of the whole Christ, right? So walking on water, changing water into wine. Um, that is, uh, somebody came to my door. <laughs> so, I, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, th- so that's true of his divinity. Um, but, but because Christ is one divine hypostasis from all eternity who assumed human nature, whatever we say, we can attribute to the whole Christ. And we mean it in a linguistic way without destroying. It's, it's a real, it's true. It's not saying that it's just linguistic, but we can say God died without meaning that the divine nature died. Right. So Christ, as the single soul subject there present uh, at his, uh, crucifixion, Christ's divine hypostasis underwent the experience of death in his human nature. But that does not mean that he, as a divine person, died. And I would just recommend that if, if anybody wants a really clear exposition of that from um, classical Trinitarian theology, just read the last five or six chapters of John Damascus's book three of the Exposition of Orthodox Faith, where he lays this out perfectly. Yeah, and and, and I think this is the thing, is, is that Muslims who are making this kind of argument, if Jesus is God and God is immortal, how can God die? If they if they if they're making that kind of argument, they're not engaging with what Christians are saying. It says in 1 Peter chapter 4 exactly what you've just said. Therefore since Christ has suffered in the flesh, not suffered in the divinity, suffered in the flesh. He's saying that he, he suffered in his humanity. It's it's right there in the apostolic writings from the beginning that the suffering that Christ underwent, he underwent in his humanity. And so to use this kind of argument as if somehow this dismisses what the Christian faith teaches means that they're not actually dismissing what we believe as Christians. What they're dismissing is is something, a straw man of their own invention. And this has been the consistent teaching of the church in in. Um, in the, uh, what is it, the uh, second letter to Nestorius, written by, let's, Cyril. Um, In the same manner we conceive respecting his dying, for the word of God is by nature immortal and incorruptible and life-giving. Since, however, his own body did, as Paul says, by the grace of God taste death for every man, he himself is said to have suffered death for us. Not as if he had any experience of death in his own nature, for it would be madness to think this. But because, as I have just said, his flesh tasted death. It's kind of like you you, you take a stick and an iron rod and you chuck them into water. One of them sinks below and one of them floats above. The, the, the two properties, the two natures experience the same event in very different ways and respond very differently. The divine nature passes over death, even though it passes through death. It, it doesn't is not affected by it, whereas the human nature falls into it. And so, you know, I would say to Hashim, who makes this argument all the time down at Speaker's Corner and to anyone who, who, who's listening to this, that if you want to dismiss Christianity, this is a stupid reason to do it. It's not a good reason. Because you're not actually arguing based upon what Christians say, but you're arguing on on something different. Yeah. Um, Should we move I, on to? Yeah. The, so uh, a lot what? of people, a lot of people in the chat are asking um, the source. I guess they didn't hear what I said. So I'm going to put in the chat first of all um, the text that I mentioned. 
what you just mentioned was Cyril uh, response Saint Cyril of Alexandria responding to Nestorius and then yeah second letter second letter second to letter. Nestorius and then I'm going to put into the chat the book three of the exposition of the Orthodox faith that I mentioned if you scroll down to the last five chapters the, the whole of book three is about Christology it's it's a it's a excellent excellent one of the most profound nuanced uh, treatises of the fathers and so Saint John Damascus is writing in the seventh eighth century so he's reflecting back on eight basically eight centuries of Christology seven centuries of Christology mm -hmm. and able to sort of synthesize this into a uh, one of the first what you could call perhaps systematic theologies in the exposition of the Orthodox faith but if you scroll down to chapters I think it's 20 for those that uh, I just put the link in the chat you'll notice that about chapter 26 yeah 25 26 is where he starts and then it's all the way down to the end which is not not very long but Chapter 25 is about the appropriation, and this is important because it's going to come into play with a lot of the texts that, that uh, people of, of these persuasions, Jehovah's Witnesses or um, Muslims yeah. use, and that's called the appropriation. And what that means is that there's a lot of times in texts where, for example, in Galatians 3.15, we read that Christ became a curse. So what that means is that Christ willingly underwent death for us, okay? It doesn't mean that the Father, God the Father, cursed uh, another divine person and therefore split the Trinity. It doesn't mean that Jesus is a human hypostasis that underwent damnation from the Trinity or something like that. So these are these are classic mistaken understanding, mistakenly understood texts uh, by groups outside of uh, the orthodoxy of Christianity that have used like, oh, well, if Christ is a curse, then he must have been a separate deity that was cursed or a separate human being that was cursed or something like that. You'll notice in chapter 26, he expounds the very thing, again, summarizing seven centuries of Christian theology on this, the very thing that we, Bob and I just mentioned, which is the impassibility of Christ's divinity and the passability of his humanity. And then you'll notice mm -hmm. in chapter 27, he goes into the, the, discussing what went on when Christ died, how the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, remained divine and impassable, and the human soul was severed from the human body. That's what happened in Christ's death, and then he will discuss the descent of Christ's soul into Hades. I would also mention, too, for people that want another testimony to something to this that's earlier, uh, there's a famous letter of St. Basil, which is, he's got two that are really important for, for uh, the Trinity and for Christology. One of those is letter eight, and letter eight is a, like a, I don't know, 15, 20 page summation of the doctrine of the Trinity. And Basil wrote that in about 360 AD. So this is pretty early, not too long mm. after the Council of Nicaea. Uh, letter 38 is way more extensive. It's, it's pretty long, and it gets into the nature-person distinction, how we believe that there's one nature in the Godhead and three divine hypostases. So if you want a, uh, an introduction to how the Church Fathers have consistently taught this, you can read Athanasius, of course, as well. Everybody knows about Athanasius. I, I think it's an important point to mention, Jay, that... that Christian apologetics can only be strengthened by familiarity with the fathers. Absolutely. You yeah, know, I'm, I'm not, it, I'm not it, it, citing it, these as, as if that means that it's true because I cited a church father. We're citing this as exactly. testimonies to the consistency of our teaching is the point. Exactly. Exactly. So I'll, I'll throw the next one at you because, and, and then we'll, we'll discuss it there. The next one, the, the kind of argument that, that Muslims make um, is the um, if Jesus is God, why? How does he eat? How does he drink? How does he? You know, this this is not befitting of God. This is not, you know, God can't do these things. God because God doesn't need food. God doesn't need water. You know, um, you know. To put it in philosophical terms, how can God be contingent? Uh, we would agree. God is not contingent. God does not need food, and God does not need water. Um, but man does, and because God took on human nature in the incarnation, namely the second person of Godhead, the, the entire Trinity did yeah. not become incarnate. Only the Son, the Logos, became incarnate. And when he became incarnate, we believe that he willed to be in that state. So he didn't need those things, and this is a very important thing. For example, when Jesus was talking to Pontius Pilate, he said, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you. And because Christ is a divine person, because he is the one who created the world, he actually willed to be in this, uh, the phrase Paul uses is kenosis, the kenotic state, which is the, um, you could say humbling, 
Uh, Jesus chose and willed to humble himself to come into our lowly state. It's not that his, that his life was forced from him, that it was taken from him. He couldn't, he didn't know what to do. Oh, I'm doubting. I'm scared. This is uh, exemplified, for example, in the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, that blasphemous movie, which presents Jesus as just this dude who's like, man, I don't know if I'm going to, do I want to do this, man? You know, he's on the cross and he's yeah. doubting and he's like, man, I could have like a, you know, hippie Jesus, basically. That's not what we believe. But all the heretics and all the cults, they believe that we believe in hippie Jesus, just this, hey. this sort of doubting prophet. But no, we believe that he's a divine person. So you're correct, that Muslim, that we would agree that God, in terms of his divinity, is impassable. Uh, he's unchanging. He's eternal. But he has the ability to enter into time and space uh, yes. and to undergo our weakness for the sake of deification, for the sake of saving us and moving us out of that state and into uh, eternal life. And that's and, the whole and, and point. He, and he undergoes and he bears this suffering. He spares this contingency in a contingent state of the humanity. It's Correct. It's the, the human nature that needs the food. It's the exactly human right. nature. Exactly right. We don't say that his divinity needed that food. We, we say exactly. rather. Exactly. And, yeah. And and so again, the 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 problem the problem that where where Muslims are, are picking up on this, they, the reason why they find this idea offensive is because they don't believe that it befits the dignity of God to do these things. They think that somehow that it is an insult to God's dignity as God that He should become these things. And I think that what that drives at is a very different vision of God, because the division of the the, the vision of God within Islam is a God of power a God of authority, a God of might, a, God, a royal ruler, as it were, who, 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 who you know, he, he's not, it's not fitting that he should dwell with his underlings, that he should dwell tabernacle with, with his creation. His creation is below him, is beneath him. It's about his royal dignity being insulted. Whereas I would say to all the Muslims who are maybe listening to this, that we're not inviting you to believe in, in your God. We're inviting you to believe in a different God, and the fundamental attribute of the God that we believe in is a God of love. And love is, is that thing that, that drives God, as it were, to, to become man, to take on the fullness of human nature. It is a, 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 an, a, 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 an overpowering, not an overpowering as if God is a slave to love, but it's the very essence of, of his nature that, that it, it forms his actions in the way that it... it it guides the way that he wishes to be, that, that, that by becoming man, he, he takes on something that is beneath his royal dignity. But it's because he's, he's, there's a, a greater, uh, something more important to him than simply royal dignity or preserving royal dignity. It is this idea of love. And you've got to ask yourself, which kind of ruler? And my, my sort of question to Muslims is, which kind of ruler is a better kind of ruler? A ruler who is so distant and far from you that he only ever sends his delegates and his, his messengers and you never see him face to face. Or a ruler who, is, who, despite the fact that he's the ruler, despite the fact that he has all of his royal dignity, which incidentally cannot be affected or stripped away from him or taken from him by anything. You know, if a king gets covered in mud, is he still a king? If a king dresses as a peasant, is he still a king? You know, does the clothes that the ruler have decide whether he is a ruler? If the queen doesn't wear the crown on her head, is she still the queen? Of course, none of the his, the, the royal dignity of God is not defined by the fact or compromised by the fact that he becomes a lowly human being. But right. it does demonstrate something about who he is as a person that he does become a human being. Yeah, that's but a great point. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about. Um, I was going to ask you about the notion of sort of being the slave of Allah. Now, Paul will use that analogy at times, where he says, "I'm a, a bond slave of Christ," and so forth. But Christ is pretty consistent with using another analogy as well of that um, we are not just made servants and slaves of God, but actually sons of God. And this, I say this because there's the idea of becoming sons and that the whole point of Christ yeah. doing what he's doing is for, for our good and to actually share in the glory that he possesses with the Father. So, for example, Jesus in John 17 says, the hour has come now glorify your son that the son might glorify you for you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. This is eternal life that they might not that they might know you, the one true God and Jesus whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I finished the work that you've given me to do. And now glorify me together with yourself with the glory that I had with you before the world was. And then he goes on to say, 
that he intends to share that glory with us as sons yep. with him. So Christ actually makes us sons, not just slaves, not just this. If you if you think of Paul's allegory in Galatians 4 of Hagar and Sarah, the slave uh, girl, and the, 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 he compares flesh Israel to those who are um, like slaves to the law. And he's saying that, no, Christ actually came to make us heirs of the promise to make us sons of God. So the whole point of this of this kenosis, this, this humbling state that Christ undergoes is not just to die and to pay a debt, but to die and to satisfy eternal justice, you could say, and then to actually raise us to a higher status, what was intended of man in the beginning so that we might participate in eternal life. And so that's all we mean by a lot of people are confused by Orthodox theology. When you talk about theosis, they'll say, Oh, you think that you're pagan and you, become gods like Aleister Crowley, apotheosis. No, no, no. We become, yeah, not no, no, no. We become uh, participants in eternal life and immortality yeah. on the basis of the uncreated grace of God. And then that's and, what and we that's, mean. And, and, and this is something, this is because, because Muslims go to the passage that you've just quoted in John 17, isn't it? Where it says, Christ, Christ says the only true God. And any Christian who knows the scripture just goes, well, keep reading, son. And then what you get to is you get to the bit where Christ says, and now glorify me, Father, with the glory that I had with you before the beginning, before the beginning, before the creation of the world, thus demonstrating Christ's divinity. Now, any Muslim who's progressed past, uh, any Muslim apologist or polemicist who's progressed past very basics of I've got you on this verse will then counter to the fact that the Christian points out Christ's pre-existent sharing of eternal glory with the father by going on and then saying ah well hold on later in that same passage it says that jesus will share that glory with his followers and thus therefore it shows that he isn't um god but actually what you're saying is 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 correct it's the idea that by taking on human form christ is elevating the humanity or, or that we have that when we are in him, when we when we embrace him, that we are able to share in the divine energy, in the divine attributes like e eternality. And here's the thing. Muslims might be scandalized by that, but don't they also believe in eternal life? Don't they also believe that they are going to enter into eternal existence? And if that eternal existence is something that is a predicate only of God alone, how can they possibly share in it? How can they have a hope of eternal um existence except by sharing in something that is the divine attribute of god alone yeah so, absolutely you know they, they've got the same they, they've got this scandal within their theology that they're not even aware of because they've never sat down and thought about it yeah i want to add to real quick uh if you want us we will be reading super chats later on so if you want to support this chat this discussion, this channel, you can do that with uh, super chat questions. There's a bit of a uh, scuffle that has <laughs> emerged in the chat. Um, the answer to this question about, uh, I just want to address this real quick because everybody's sort of obsessed with this. When we say that Christ suffered death in his humanity, that's absolutely orthodox. That's in the creed. You have to believe that his human nature underwent death. So we're not saying that his his humanity died and ceased to exist. He underwent the experience of death in his humanity. Read book three of St. John Damascus. And then in the resurrection, he raised and restored that nature to a higher state. That is the Orthodox doctrine. He did, he did die uh, in his human nature. And so whoever this guy is that's saying that Christ can't die in his humanity is incorrect. Emil, you are incorrect. Anyway, so... Uh, Let's yes, he is incorrect. He is incorrect. It says it in Scripture. The the Apostolic Fathers teach it, and and you know the the, the other thing to bear in mind is that lots of people confuse death with non-existence. Right. It isn't That's that a good point. Christ died and ceased to exist in any state. Christ continued to exist. The Logos continued to exist, but he no longer continued to exist in the state that existed before death. Right, and that, and that's a point that that lots of people confuse. Now, I'm just thinking, Jay, we're, we're running out of time to get through all of these 15. So, what I suggest is, we yeah, you pick ahead. one, I pick, and oh. we 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 hammer two more, and then we move on to our next topic. So, okay. is there a particular one that you want to have a go at? Yeah, let's see. We got several here. Um, yeah, here's a good one that comes up, and actually, several of these are kind of derivative of this of the same issue. Why does, Jesus, them, yeah. why does Jesus say in John 17, 3, I'll let you answer and I'll give you the, my answer. Why does Jesus say the Father is greater than I? And why does Jesus say I'm ascending to my Father uh, 
uh, to my God and to your God. How does Jesus have a God if he's God? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, if you go to Philippians chapter 2, you've already alluded to it. You know the passage that I'm going to quote. Reading from verse three, Christ, and and this is an important thing because it demonstrates that 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 our moral conduct is actually rooted in theological truths, because Paul is about to make a a statement about how we should behave based upon um, a theological narrative. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So when when the divine Logos, when the, the divine Logos who shared the glory with the Father before the world was became a man, he's not going to become an atheist man. He's not going to suddenly deny God's existence, is he? And so when he becomes a man, he takes on the status of a servant, it says, which is the way to interpret all of these statements about I am going to my God and your God. Because in his humanity, his humanity as also being the person of the son, because that's a continuous state all the way through both post and Um, pre-incarnation there is that status in which he is the son of the father but now he is the son of the father in human form and humanity must glorify God that is what it's all about that's what the whole purpose of life is that our humanity glorifies God and Christ being the perfect man glorifies God the father and so he can speak rightfully in his humanity of having my my God and your God he's speaking to human beings he's speaking as a human being um and what was the the other passage that you you mentioned about um the the father being the only true God yeah the father is greater than I yeah this is a classic one I mean, the, the the father is greater than I in the sense that he is he is he is taken on a, a human nature. This is not a, a statement about this is not a statement about that his ontology in his divinity is somehow less than the father's. It is that he is taken on a lower status than the father. The scripture is clear that he is taken on the form of a servant, and thus he can rightfully speak as the father being greater than I. Um, you know, and but but when you when you look at these passages, Christ also says things like "Honor me as you honor the Father." Now, you're a logical thinking person, Jay, and I'm sure many of your audience must be as well, because that's the kind of person you'll attract. Who is who is the Father? The Father is God. How do you honor God? You honor God with divine worship. You honor God as God. So, if Jesus Christ is saying saying "Honor me as you honor the Father," what is he saying? He's saying, honor me as God. And the, the, the worst thing that a Muslim can do is to try to use John to argue against the idea of Christ's divinity, when the whole point of John's gospel is to demonstrate Christ's divinity. Um, you know, there's another passage where, where Christ says, I of myself can do nothing. In that same passage, which is John 5, Christ also says, honor me as you honor the Father. And he says, I do exactly what I see the Father doing. Everything that the father, what the father does, I do. If we just go to it, I want to get the exact wording because it is important. In John five, Christ says, "Truly, truly, I say to you, the son of the the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing." And Muslims use this as an argument to show that Christ is not God. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Now, just think about that. Whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. So when the father creates, what does the son do? When the father gives life, what does the son do? When the father, um, you know, exists before the world or creates the angels or commands the angels, what does, does the son do? You know, and, 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 and Muslims miss all of this. They're just picking and choosing individual verses out of context And it demonstrates a lack of sincerity on their part that they are not engaging with the text. And invariably, when you read just a bit further on, a bit further down, it always compromises their argument. When Christ says that the Father is the only true God, 
He's speaking to Jews in a context in which they are being dominated by Romans and had just been previously dominated by Greeks, both of which were pagans. So to say that, that the father was the only true God is to say that, 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 that Caesar is not a God or that Pluto is not a God or that, you know, Jupiter is not a God, that none of these other gods are God, that the father alone is God in that context. But that none of the statements that Muslims use ever, ever create the impression that Jesus is just a man. There's always room within the interpretation that Jesus, even when he says that the father is the only true God, doesn't exclude Christ from divinity. It doesn't exclude Christ from divinity. It doesn't say that I am just a human being. You know, and when, when Muslims say, well, show me where Jesus says I am God in these words. Well, show me where Jesus says I am just a human being. It doesn't say that. You know, it's a silly form of argument. But yeah. What well, of course, and he, and he actually does say many times over, I am. <laughs> so he actually does. Yes, exactly. I mean, and when you understand that uh, the Old Testament uh, theophanies are actually manifestations of the Logos, uh, then many, many times over, all throughout the Old Testament, every time God is speaking and saying, I am the Lord, there is no other, that's actually Jesus talking. <laughs> so, Amen. but they don't actually understand that because they, they don't understand that. They think Jesus is like this this new creation, like the, you know, like Arians thought that, uh, that he, or, well, actually don't, don't, don't Muslims think that there was, there's some kind of logos that's related to Jesus or something like this. You would know more about this than well, me. They, they say that they, that Muslims say that Jesus is the creation of, um, Allah, that he created Allah by, that, that, that Allah created Jesus by a word, that, that Jesus is just a word spoken by Allah. Um, and in their theology, they, they just think it's the word command be, and he became, it's kind of like that. But, but. I, I don't think they they they've thought through the the implication that 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 it's the, the Quranic text. Um, I mean, in fact, I might be able to just find it. Uh, let's. The I mean, th there are some Christians that argue that this actually demonstrates that even in the Quran there is this idea of Christ's divinity. Because how can God ever be separated from His word? So if if Jesus is but a word from Allah. Well, that word must have eternally been with Allah, you know. Um, Muslims have the a complication within the idea that the, the, the divine attributes, like the words that we find in the Quran, are eternal. Is an eternal book, but this this eternal book, these eternal words that have apparently always existed in the mother of the book, have become now written texts. And so you have a, a compromising of the what is said to be a divine attribute, a divine reality, uh, crossing over the barrier and entering into um, the, the the contingent world, as it were. Um, but they don't have they don't have the same view of Jesus that we do. They think he is just a creation, um, akin to Adam. Being it became is is their logic. Some Christians argue that because the Quran says that. Um, that Jesus is just a word from Allah, that therefore that word is also eternal. And you can make that kind of argument, certainly. Um, the, the Quran is not without its problems on that. Okay, so I'm sorry, I need to address this again because the chat is being ridiculous. So Emil, uh, I explained earlier on the communicatio idiomatum. This is St. Cyril's explanation that whatever is true of either natures can be spoken of the whole Christ. That does not mean that when we speak of the death of Christ, that we don't therefore mean that he died in his humanity. The divine nature is impassable. When we say the nature of Christ, humans, Christ's human nature, does, it's the person of the Logos that underwent death in his human nature. It is the human nature that died. You're committing the monophysite, theopascite heresy by saying that the Logos died. That's why St. Cyril explains it as communicatio idiomatum. The Logos died in his humanity. The whole section of Book 3 of John Damascus refutes the basic mistake that you're making. And I'm going to ban you because you keep monopolizing the chat over something that is not the topic that we're discussing. It's a basic Christological mistake that you're making, and you won't listen. That's why I'm going to ban you. Anyway, I'm sorry. So uh, let's move on maybe to um, the issue of... Christian politics. Do you want to move on to that? Because I do have, actually I have a debate with the Kurgan that's coming up here in a little bit. Um, no, you don't agree with what I just said, because what I just said is addressing the mistake that you're making. We have to distinguish 
nature and person even after Christ is incarnate. He has two natures. He does not die in his divinity. That's why you don't get communicatio idiomatum. Anything that we say of either of the natures is true of the whole Christ. So did God die? Yes, in the sense of his human nature undergoing death. This is a basic mistake that you're making. You're starting to make me mad.